The small town of Kidwelly in West Wales was shocked when Mabel Greenwood died after a brief illness on the 16th of June 1919. She was held in high regard, and although she was known to have health issues, there had been no suggestion that her demise would be so sudden. Nor were people impressed when her husband, Harold, proposed marriage to two different women within weeks of his wife's death, one of whom was the sister of the doctor who had treated his wife in her final illness. Small towns in Wales are like small towns elsewhere. Their inhabitants have a moral code inextricably woven into the social fabric. They like to see this code observed, particularly by other people. They watch their neighbours jealously for signs of possible transgressions, and they possess an excellent system for spreading news of such transgressions when they occur. So it wasn't surprising that when Harold Greenwood married an attractive 31-year-old woman called Gladys Jones, just three months after his wife's death, that the town was indignant. In fact, people began to wonder openly about the death of Mabel Greenwood and whether it was an accident at all. Harold Greenwood was a sportsman. He dressed in plus twos, and he liked to wager. He was also known to be something of a philanderer in the West Wales town. Was it possible he was also a murderer? There was plenty to fuel these rumours and the circumstances of Mabel's death alone. Although she had been in poor health for some time, the nature and cause of her illnesses were a matter of some conjecture as her doctor was a close friend of Harold Greenwood's. Her final illness, however, was real enough, and her death was very sudden. Having eaten a gooseberry tart for dessert at Sunday lunch on the 15th of June, Mrs. Greenwood had become violently ill. Dr. Griffiths had been sent for, and had given her some medicine, and then gone off to play golf with her husband. He saw her in the evening, too, as she only lived across the road from him and he decided she looked better. A friend of Mabel's, a Miss Phillips, however, did not agree when she called round in the evening, and she sent for the district nurse immediately. The district nurse, Elizabeth Jones, found Mrs. Greenwood in a state of collapse when she arrived, and she and Mrs. Greenwood's daughter, Irene, sent Harold off to fetch the doctor. He disappeared for an hour, apparently spent this time chatting to the doctor's sister, May Griffiths, and then returned home without the doctor, and fell asleep. Meanwhile, Mabel Greenwood's condition was deteriorating rapidly, and Nurse Jones and Irene were thoroughly alarmed. Nurse Jones shook Harold Greenwood awake, and ordered him to fetch the doctor immediately, saying, with great urgency, This may be a crisis. At this, Greenwood got up and went to fetch Griffiths, but returned in a little while to say he could not rouse the doctor, as he was asleep. The nurse brushed this aside, crossed the street herself, and returned with the doctor. In spite of this, at 3.30am on the 16th of June, 1919, Mabel Greenwood died. Dr. Griffiths gave the cause of death as heart failure. The matter of Mabel Greenwood's death and her husband's behaviour very soon became the talk of the town. In fact, the collective imagination of Kidwelly went into overdrive and had soon persuaded itself that Greenwood had something to do with it. Rumours had acquired a life of their own and the police, who had begun to receive complaints about the matter, visited Nurse Jones and took a statement from her. The local coroner decided, reluctantly, that the only thing that would satisfy public concerns in this matter would be to exhume the body of Mrs. Greenwood and hold an autopsy to confirm that death had been due to heart failure and to show that there had been no foul play. The body of Mabel Greenwood was thus exhumed in April 1920 and a post-mortem carried out. It showed no evidence of heart failure whatever but it did reveal a sizable quantity of arsenic in her stomach. An inquest was held on the 15th and 16th of June 1920, at which an account of the events leading to Mrs. Greenwood's death was heard, and a jury was invited to give a verdict on the cause of death. It did so, and the foreman, George Jones, without any equivocation, 
declared that the jury's verdict was murder by arsenical poisoning administered by Harold Greenwood. Harold Greenwood was arrested exactly one year to the day after his wife's death and he was charged with the murder of his wife. Harold Greenwood was born in Yorkshire in 1874 and he married Mabel Bowater, an heiress and daughter of Sir William Van Sittart Bowater, in 1896. They moved to Kidwelly in West Wales in 1898 and here acquired a large house with servants and they had four children. Although Harold's legal practice didn't thrive, they lived comfortably due to Mabel's generous income from her family and fitted in well with the local community. Mary had a keen sense of civic duty, was involved in the local church and various institutions, while Harold enjoyed going to the races, betting on sporting events, captaining the local cricket team, and pursuing local girls. In June 1919, their eldest child, Irene, who was 22, lived at home with them, while the other three children were away at boarding school. Harold Greenwood appeared before Carmarthen Assizes on the 2nd of November 1920, charged with the murder of his wife, Mabel Greenwood. The prosecution sought to show that he had purchased arsenic in the form of a weed killer preparation, that he had administered it to Mabel at lunchtime on the 15th of June in a bottle of burgundy, and that he had done so because he wished to be free of her. The Greenwood's parlour maid, Hannah Williams, testified that Harold had entered the pantry from the garden before that fatal lunch, something he had not done before, and that the bottle of wine had disappeared by the following day. Mrs. Greenwood had felt ill after Sunday lunch, and suspected that the gooseberry tart she had eaten had disagreed with her. As Mrs. Greenwood had demonstrably been given the arsenic at around lunchtime on the 15th, and certainly well before 5 p.m., it seemed probable that whoever had administered the poison did so at that lunchtime. It also seemed a certainty that the poison had been given to her alone, and this could only have been done by a member of her family present at the lunch, either her daughter Irene or husband Harold, as the other three children were absent. As no suspicion attached to the daughter, and the conduct of the father, the motive, the purchase of arsenic, and all other circumstances rested with him. It was the prosecution's contention that he had deliberately poisoned his wife. As a solicitor, Harold Greenwood knew the importance of a good barrister in court, and in 1920 there was no better barrister in England, or Wales, than Sir Edward Marshall Hall. Marshall Hall had a hypnotic effect on juries, a man of enormous presence and charisma, his disinterest in the technicalities of the law was compensated for by his unique ability to influence a jury and portray his client as someone caught up in circumstances beyond their control. By 1920 he was nearing the end of his career, and although his health was failing, his reputation was never stronger. As the trial got underway, Marshall Hall set to work to undermine the evidence against his client, and he identified two principal witnesses whose evidence he considered he must challenge if he was to secure an acquittal. These were the doctor who had certified the death as heart failure, and the maid whose testimony suggested Mrs. Greenwood had drunk the wine and been the only one to do so. Marshall Hall developed the idea that Dr. Griffiths, who had been called to see Mrs. Greenwood after she became ill and had given her morphia, may have inadvertently caused her death by doing so, owing to her weak heart. In this, the doctor made an important error by initially stating at the police court that he had given Mrs. Greenwood two morphia pills, which contained a combined total of one grain of morphia. This could have killed a woman of uncertain health, as Mrs. Greenwood undoubtedly was, but at the trial he said he had erred in his statement to the police court, and had meant to say that he had given her two opium pills, which were approximately one-fortieth the strength of the morphia pills, and could not possibly have killed her. <laughs> 
Marshall Hall was obliged to defer his cross-examination to give him time to contend with this unwelcome development. But before he did so, he succeeded in wresting from the doctor an opinion that he did not believe that two morphia pills would have proved fatal to her. The following day, Marshall Hall returned to this proposition and questioned the doctor on it. The doctor claimed that he had thought they were talking about opium pills when he had said he didn't think such pills would prove fatal to her. But Marshall Hall's line of questioning succeeded in giving a strong and perhaps justifiable impression that the doctor was confused about the difference between the two types of pill. And he also obtained a further statement from the doctor that opium pills were sometimes called morphia pills. This was a contention which the Home Office pathologist was forced to express his surprise at. The situation played out to Marshall Hall's advantage even further, because he requested that the doctor produce the prescription he had made out for the pills. The doctor had only a piece of paper which he had copied from his prescription book, and when Marshall Hall requested that he produce the original, he was forced to concede that it had been destroyed upon his retirement at the end of 1919. But Marshall Hall was able to demonstrate that the note produced as a copy by the doctor was copied from the prescription book in June of 1920, and therefore the prescription book itself must have been destroyed much more recently than the doctor claimed. This may only have meant that Dr. Griffiths was as incompetent at maintaining records as he seemed to be at doctoring, but it gave an overall impression that the doctor may have administered the wrong pills to Mrs. Greenwood and thus have been responsible for her death. Marshall Hall also attacked the other piece of evidence which provided the mainstay of the prosecution's case, that of the parlour maid, her testimony that Mrs. Greenwood alone had drunk the wine, that Harold Greenwood had been in the pantry beforehand, and that the bottle of wine had disappeared by the following day, underpinned the contention of the prosecution that this is how the arsenic had been administered to Mrs. Greenwood by her husband. Marshall Hall proceeded to coax a series of contradictions from the parlour maid in cross-examination, and to suggest that the police had bullied her, and that she was, in fact, very unsure of what had happened on the 15th of June, 1919. When the defence produced the Greenwood's daughter, Irene, who had clearly been heavily coached by Marshall Hall, she testified that she had drunk some of the wine her mother had drunk. It was the fatal blow to the prosecution case. The prosecution tried to change tack by suggesting that the poison could have been administered to Mrs. Greenwood by other means, but abandoning their long-term contention, which had pinned all on the wine bottle as the means of administration, which now seemed to be ill-founded, was fatal to their case. In fact, when the judge, Montague Shearman, summed up, he referred to the daughter's claim by commenting, Well, if she also drank from the bottle, there is an end of the case. The jury retired and returned to inform the judge that, the evidence before us is insufficient and does not conclusively satisfy us as to how and by whom the arsenic was administered. We therefore return a verdict of not guilty. The jury had accepted that arsenic had been administered, but could not say conclusively how it had been done or by whom, and there was even uncertainty as to whether the arsenic itself had been the actual cause of death. There was, of course, a strong suspicion and probability that it was administered by Greenwood, but Marshall Hall had imbued sufficient doubt into the jury's mind as to make conviction impossible. Harold Greenwood was freed, to the general satisfaction of the press, although the population of Kidwelly, who had done so much to bring about his arrest and trial for murder, were less impressed by his acquittal. Of course, there was no other suspect in the matter, no other credible means by which arsenic could have been ingested in such quantities by her, so Greenwood was widely believed to have got away with the murder of his wife. The evidence against Harold Greenwood was problematic from the start, and although he always looked likely to be the murderer, 
the prosecution's reliance on the lunchtime wine being the means by which he had administered the arsenic was demolished by his daughter's testimony that she had drunk the same wine as her mother. Whether she had or not is a different matter, of course, but it effectively ended the prosecution's case. Yet considering the circumstances in the case and weighing the probabilities, the evidence, although circumstantial, is convincing. Who else could have administered the arsenic? No one else had a motive. Mabel was well-liked, highly regarded in the community, and only her daughter, Irene, and her husband, Harold, were present at home. Harold Greenwood was the only person in whom a motive could be discerned. He was known as a ladies' man, and although he claimed his wife's money went principally to the children in the event of her death, he clearly inherited money and property from her because it enabled him to secure the services of Sir Edward Marshall Hall, who commanded the highest fees for his advocacy. Greenwood had little money of his own. Harold Greenwood had bought the arsenic as a weed killer in February and April of 1919, and he said he had used it on the weeds. It seems he had not previously bought arsenic as a weed killer. That it was bought for the purpose of killing weeds is therefore suspicious in the circumstances. Harold proposed to two women in the weeks following his wife's death. Although that's an unusual thing, in itself it means little, but in the context of his wife's murder and the absence of other motives and suspects, it is highly suggestive. Mrs. Greenwood was in poor health. She was older than him, and she had become an encumbrance to Mr. Greenwood who possessed a certain vitality. She hindered his social and other activities. The lack of a viable alternative. In practical terms, the only way in which Mrs. Greenwood could have been poisoned with arsenic would be one, by taking it herself, two, by her daughter having administered it to her, three, by a servant administering it, four, by her husband administering it, or five by the doctor administering it. No one else had the means and opportunity of administering the arsenic to her, and the case for supposing that she had either taken it herself or that her daughter or servants gave it to her is really only a theoretical one. The same applies to Marshall Hall's suggestion at the trial that it may have been on the skins of the gooseberries as a result of its being blown up by the wind from the weeds which had been treated with it. The weight of probability is heavily in favour of the husband administering the arsenic to her, and it is surely beyond a reasonable doubt that he did so. That Dr. Griffiths killed Mrs. Greenwood by prescribing morphia is feasible, but the likelihood that an attempt to kill her with arsenic coincided with an accidental or deliberate administration of morphia is negligible. Unless Dr. Griffiths was Harold Greenwood's accomplice. There is much to recommend the idea that there was some form of collusion between Dr. Griffiths and Harold Greenwood for a number of reasons. Firstly, the two were very close friends and had been since Harold's arrival in Kidwelly. Secondly, Harold was in a relationship with the doctor's sister May, as evidenced by the letter he wrote her two days after proposing to Gladys Jones. In that letter, he also indicated that his children had turned against May. The obvious reason for this is that they were quite aware of the relationship between the two. In that same letter, he referred to rumours and her ability to face the music. In this, he may have referred to the rumours concerning his own part in his wife's death. But this doesn't seem likely. At this point, only weeks after his wife's death, the rumours had not yet become the maelstrom they were soon to become. It is more likely he is referring to the rumours which existed concerning himself and May which he seems to have acknowledged had turned his children against her. Thirdly, when Mabel Greenwood became ill, the doctor did not diagnose her illness correctly. That is somewhat forgivable, because poisoning would not be the first thing to spring to mind.
but his failure to take samples as the symptoms worsened was negligent and removed the consideration of other possibilities for her illness. Fourthly, even when Mabel was displaying clear signs of deterioration, he failed to act. Miss Phillips saw immediately that Mabel was seriously ill and sent for the district nurse. If she could see this, why couldn't he? The district nurse also saw the illness as being a crisis. By this she meant, quite unmistakably, that Mabel might die. Yet her request that Greenwood fetch the doctor immediately was met with astonishing dilatoriness by Greenwood, and perhaps by the doctor. Fifthly, after Mabel had died at 3.30 a.m., Dr. Griffiths gave her cause of death as heart failure. This was quite absurd. The woman had been violently ill. All her symptoms were those of acute poisoning. How was it possible for any medical person to attribute her death to heart failure in these circumstances? In fact, Dr. Griffiths' best defense in this respect would seem to be his utter incompetence as a medical practitioner. Sixthly, if Dr. Griffiths did expedite Mabel's death that night by giving her morphine because the arsenic earlier administered by her husband was taking a long time, then this would provide a sound reason for his apparent confusion over the difference between opium pills and morphia pills at the trial. It would also account for his destruction of the prescription book, which Marshall Hall expressed incredulity at. And finally, Greenwood took a grave risk in poisoning his wife. Unless he knew with some certainty that he could depend on the doctor to sign a death certificate for an unrelated cause, and thus avoid an autopsy. The only way in which he could be certain of this is if the doctor was his collaborator. Whatever occurred that night, their friendship did not survive the trial, and this is understandable as the doctor had his reputation dragged through the mud in court. But the end of their friendship makes yet greater sense in the context of a collaboration which had gone wrong. From Dr. Griffith's perspective, Greenwood's crass and incautious behavior following Mabel's death led to the exhumation order and inquest neither of which would have happened but for his inciting local suspicion. It is to Marshall Hall's credit and his considerable skill as an advocate that he was able to persuade the jury that there was reasonable doubt, and in this he was fortunate to have Irene Greenwood testify that she had drunk the same wine as her mother. He was also fortunate in having a doctor of such apparent incompetence treating Mrs. Greenwood. It seems that Harold was in financial difficulties and the removal of his wife would ease his circumstances. His business, never very sound, had suffered further in those post-war years and his betting habits imposed an additional strain in this respect. But of far greater significance than this was the fact that he was a man of relentless amorous ambitions which could only be furthered by ridding himself of his wife. The woman he married, Gladys Jones, was from a wealthy family herself and was someone he'd known for years. And given the haste with which Greenwood moved upon the death of his wife, it invites suspicion that this was not simply a friendship which grew out of bereavement, but one which pre-existed his wife's death. The extent of that relationship, beyond local gossip, cannot be known. And yet two days after proposing to Gladys, he wrote to Dr. Griffith's sister May, declaring his love and proposing marriage. My dearest May, he wrote, you are the one I love most in this world. As these circumstances became known, as they quickly did in such a small town, Greenwood came to be regarded with the deepest suspicion. Doubtless he knew very well, as a legal man, the procedures for certifying death, and must surely have known that the doctor, a personal friend and neighbor was either incompetent as witnessed by his various actions or else, as I suspect, had his consent or assistance or at least his compliance in the matter.
Whether Greenwood administered arsenic by means of the burgundy or by some other means cannot be known. But administer it he did, at some time between lunch and 5 p.m. on Sunday the 15th of June. Greenwood's reluctance and failure to rouse Dr. Griffiths in the night, when Mabel's condition was clearly causing great alarm to his daughter and to Nurse Jones, is beyond mere negligence. The delay he caused, with or without the doctor's connivance, is obstructive in its effect, and it's difficult to avoid the conclusion that its purpose was to bring about her end. Ultimately, of course, Greenwood was undone not by his guilt, but by his unwillingness to conform to the code which society demands of its members in the circumstances of a spouse's death, that he did not, or could not, wait a decent period before paying his attentions to other women, outraged local feeling. That he openly pursued at least two other women, appeared also to have dallied with Nurse Jones, and married Gladys Jones within three months of his wife's death, could produce only one effect. That his disregard for his wife, for her death, and for the unwritten social conventions attending such occasions, pointed to his involvement in her death. That may be a wrong conclusion for the community to have drawn, but it is the one which they drew, and it ultimately led to the exhumation of his wife, to the discovery of arsenic in her stomach, and to a charge of willful murder being made against him. That Harold Greenwood was found not guilty at the Carmarthen Assizes did not materially alter the opinions of the community, and he was forced to move from Kidwelly after the trial. He changed his name to Pilkington and moved with his second wife Gladys to the village of Selleck in Herefordshire to a house named Rose Cottage. He was financially ruined by the trial and the payment of the legal expenses for his defence, although he never fully paid Marshall Hall for his services and was apparently the only client whom Marshall Hall had defended on a capital charge who did not thank him after the trial. In the end, there was little of the money left with which Harold Greenwood had presumably hoped to enjoy his new life with Gladys. He was said to be a shadow of his former self after the trial, less outgoing than he had been, was known as something of a recluse in the small Hereford community where he had settled, and was very protective of his privacy. No one knew of his background or of his true identity, still less that he had faced a charge of murdering his wife in Kidwelly in 1920. His own health deteriorated rapidly in the following years, and he died in 1929 at the age of 55.